However, there are other metals in there, aluminum, nickel, and cobalt, all of them, and oxygen, so that the, the lithium only makes up about 4% of the weight of the main materials uh, in the battery. And thinking as a non-chemist, I'm thinking, <clears throat> you know, lithium is not all that uh, is not all that common. It's got the same chemistry as as uh, sodium does. Uh, it's lighter weight than sodium, but pretty much the same chemistry. Uh, however, the processes that create lithium in the sun are in a supernova. Uh, there are also some processes that uh, destroy lithium, turn it into a, a couple of uh, helium-3 atoms. And so that means that we don't have much lithium on Earth. But you find it where you find sodium, in other words, salt flats and salt mines and that sort of thing. Uh, my suspicion is that uh, Lithium is going to be, <clears throat> it's not going to offer that much advantage when people start uh, thinking about cost. Maybe they could make a sodium battery that would be more or less the same but weigh just a hair more. It might be, it might offer some advantage. But then, then comes the problem of uh, charging up your battery. Uh, and a typical number, uh, and I think this is, well, anyway, it's, it's the common number, about 270 watt hours per, per mile is about the figure that you can expect to get. So if you take a 200 mile round trip, that's uh, 54 kilowatt hours. That, that's me going up to the south side of Denver and coming back. So I've used up you know, 54 kilowatt hours. Now, if I recharge that battery with a one kilowatt charger, all I have to do is wait 54 hours. <laughs> if I use uh, 10 kilowatts, uh, which is the equivalent of two electric dryers running full blast, uh, then it'll take 5.4 hours. And if I go into a, uh, uh, one of these Tesla highfalutin 120 kilowatt stations, well, then it only takes about uh, 25, 30 minutes to charge up the battery or something like that. And I think that that is going to be a little bit of a hard problem for, for people to want to contend with. Uh, and being a good futurist, is that me? No, can't be. <clears throat> I would suggest that uh, the, the future of the electric car for quite a while is going to be for the two-car family, where uh, husband, wife, somebody, you know, uses a car to run around town uh, doing doing small things around town and so forth electric car would be really pretty nice you go for drive come home plug the thing in you never go to a gas station you'll miss all those convenience stores um, <clears throat> and okay, let, let me ask Walter about this because Walter you just you bought an electric vehicle so let's talk about what have you seen as the pros and cons oh well <laughs> Yeah, I, I've had a I've had a, a couple of electric vehicles. Um, first, I had a Taycan, and I traded that in, and I got a, an Audi e-tron GT. I don't know why I did it, but anyway, um, I think personally, I think battery EVs. I think they um, I think they create more problems than they actually solve, and I think the problems pretty much are very similar to what they were 120 years ago. Um, I mean, with battery electric vehicles, um, there's I'm sure you, many of you have heard of the concept of range anxiety. Well, most of them have a very short range. Now, there are, Tesla does have long range ones, and also Tesla has a great charging network. And it's a private network, it's an excellent network. So if you were going to do lots of long trips, I would say don't do anything other than a Tesla. You would, because Electrify America, ChargePoint, all those others, we just don't have the infrastructure. 
Um, I think the other problem with the infrastructure is that to build out a massive infrastructure, it's one thing to have, I, I, in other words, I think BEVs are more of a niche market. I think they're a market that will be here, but I don't think that they, and I'll talk maybe a little bit more later, but I really believe that the future is plug-in hybrids as well as hybrids, and I think there will be a mix of those. But I believe that the future, as opposed to politicians saying we're going BEVs, I don't think the politicians are really thinking about what does it entail to if you were to go within a purely BEV world. Speaking specifically of lithium, it takes 500,000 pounds okay, of earth to be dug up just to get a kilogram of, um, of, li of lithium, okay, to get a, to get a thousand pounds of, a kilogram of lithium, okay? It takes 500,000 pounds of water, okay, to get that, to, to process that lithium because it's processed in salt mines. Typically, I mean, most of the lithium, as far as where it's actually being produced, is um, in Chile, Argentina, Bolivia, also China, China as well. Um, and, um, but the thing is, it's a very, very dirty process. And so, I, and so you have this sort of trade-off, what they call the well to wheel, from the well to the actual wheel. A BEV, indeed, will give you basically, relative to a, a conventional internal combustion um, engine car, you will have 50% lower emissions over the life of the BEV, okay? But when you think about the BEV as, as far as the production of the lithium itself and the downstream effects of it, where you have basically water, you know, water issues, particularly in some of the driest parts of the world, in Bolivia and, and Argentina and Chile. Um, the downstream effects where this stuff gets into the rivers, rivers and streams, and it affects and impacts animals all the way, you know, down, downstream. The thing is, you're trading off one issue for the other. And I'm going to tell you, just give you an example of, of the thinking here. California, where I live, in Southern California, we import 60% of our oil from foreign sources. So all you're doing here in the case of these BVs is you are shifting the environmental problem from one place to another. So you can virtue signal and say, oh, you know, California by 2035, it'll be all BEVs. Well, that's virtue signaling because all the dirty work is not going to be going on in California. The dirty work is going to be shifted to places that aren't even going to do the mine, you know, the, the production, the mining and extraction and, um, and production of all that work is not going to take place in California where they have this ridiculous, um, this ridiculous Walter, idea. Walter, why did you buy two EVs then? <laughs> well, okay, I bought two EVs. Well, the thing is, I was, I, it was before I was knowledgeable about BEVs. I thought, wow, because they're fast. I mean, let's face it, I, I have an Audi e-tron GT, and I mean, it is, it is super fast. It is so much fun to drive, and the Cork's so point... The, the, the market and the customers like these vehicles, right? They do, but I think it serves a niche market. But the question is, can you do this at scale? Do you know what the number one selling luxury vehicle is in the world? <laughs> No, I don't. The Model S in Europe, in the U.S., and in China. So I'm not sure that that's a niche when they're beating Lexus, when they're beating uh, BMW, when they're beating Mercedes, when they're beating Audi. And oh, by the way, it's in the early stages. So I'll come back to some of your other points in a minute. But I, I, let me just add this. I think it's time that we look at fueling our vehicles with domestic energy. The efficiency of an electric vehicle is many times better because of the heat loss. We had a presentation earlier where someone talked about that. And we should let the market decide what is the best choice, the best solution, the best utility that a vehicle can provide. And I think it's wonderful that all these vehicles are being offered. And oh, by the way, right now, Tesla is, per unit, the most profitable vehicle. So it is a business of the future. China is currently dominating the market too, so I think we, as innovators, want to take that challenge on. But, okay, so let's dig into that question a little bit further. So this current year, 2022 car and driver uh, predicts about five percent of vehicles shipped in the United States will be uh, electric. So where does that go from here? Does it go to 10 percent, 50 percent, 100 percent over time, or do we hit barriers? And what are those barriers? And, I, and well, that was what I was mentioning about scale. How do you scale this up from you know? 10 or 12 million cars in the United States to 300 million. How do you scale this up to 1.2 what billion cars in, in, in the country? And the, and the thing is the pressure that you're putting on the environment with respect to getting the lithium, getting the cobalt, getting all the rare, the rare, earth, the rare earth elements, 
that's something a model that I don't that I don't think can scale. What I do think you can. What I do think is there's a ha there's a medium here. There's a happy medium, and I think the plug-in hybrids, as well as the hybrid technology, which is continuing to improve, I think that gives you. I th I think that's something that can scale because it ta you can have for every battery electric vehicle you build, you can build five or six plug-in hybrids or or, hy or hybrid or straight hybrid vehicles. Um, and so I think you can get better economies, you get better economies of scale in, in, in that manner. Plus, you don't have the issues with plug-in hybrids. In other words, I've been stuck many times. I needed to go somewhere. I needed to drive to LA from Orange County, and I couldn't get there because I didn't have enough charge, and I had to rush and get the car charged. Well, if I had in a plug-in hybrid, and by the way, I actually have a Panamera plug-in hybrid on order, uh, <laughs> Porsche Panamera. Um, that's going to be my next car because I'm just kind of tired of the whole BEV thing. But the thing is with a Panamera, I'm going to keep it charged. But the thing is, I'm never going to be in a situation where, oh my goodness, I've got to get somewhere. I don't have time and it's going to take me 30 minutes to an hour to charge this car. And I can tell you, with Electrify America, and they do, Audi does offer it free for three, year, three years of charging. But half the time, it doesn't charge anywhere near the 150 kilowatts. The other half the time, you might get, it'll step down like you, 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 you plug it in and you walk off, think you're going to grab lunch and come back in half an hour, and you look, you check about 10 minutes later and it's gone down to 43 and it's telling you it's going to be an hour and nine minutes before your car is charged. So also, you know, with, it, with respect to infrastructure, you've got to build that out. And I tell you, the, the, the pace of the cars themselves versus whether the infrastructure can keep up, that's a huge question, is question as well, because I'm always competing against other people to get that free charge. <laughs>